Okay, uh, welcome back. We're um, just about to uh, get started with a, a special panel session um, on the other AI automation, innovation, and the future of work in Asia. And this is a special panel with the kind support and collaboration of the Comrade Adenauer Foundation. Um, I'd like to introduce the moderator of the Comrade Adenauer Foundation, Rabea Brower who has extensive experience in governance, uh, notably at uh, the state level in Germany, and also uh, working with the Comrade Adenauer Foundation in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, and Vietnam. Um, she then uh, directed the Asia Pacific office of the Comrade Adenauer Foundation back in Germany before coming in 2019 to Tokyo, where she directs uh, the office there. She's a representative director in Japan and also is responsible for the program on economic governance in Asia. So it remains for me to say good morning, Rabea. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Can you hear me, Joe? I can, I hear you and I see you. So I shall pass the baton over to you to get us started with this panel, which I look forward to very much. Thank you very much, Joe, for the kind introduction. A warm hello to our fellow um, speakers, which I'm seeing on the screen. A warm welcome to everyone who is joining our panel and to those who are watching us live on YouTube. Not in Italy though very much because there we have the biggest time gap today to bridge. Um, so a very good morning to Elisabetta. I warmly welcome all of you to our special panel session within the AAS conference. It is a particular honor that Joe pulled us on board and we can be part of this uh, prestigious event. And so far it's been going very successful um, from a full uh, all present format to a very digital format. And we here in Japan have been enjoying the sessions that we've been watching so far. So now let's stage our event. We are, will be talking today about the other AI automation, innovation and the future of work in Asia, which is a very, very timely subject given all the changes that we are witnessing so far. And this roundtable um, session is presented to you by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and hosted uh, by me, Rabia Bauer. So I am chairing this and I will be taking all of your questions that you can put in the chat or send us through other channels. A quick word to um, our organization, to the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. We have proudly have 120 offices worldwide. We are currently implementing around 200 projects. Our headquarters is in Berlin. And um, more and more we function as a think tank and a consultancy agency. And our analysis and uh, concepts, they target politicians, parliamentarians, and all sorts of decision makers. And uh, we do stage some 200 to 2,500 conferences each year, reaching out to 150 people worldwide. And um, very well known democracy, rule of law, good governance, human rights, and social market economy are our principles within those conferences. And next to security and foreign policy, we do focus on social economic subjects. And this is why we are participating here today. And um, Countries and its populations, they have to deal at great length with changing word patterns, changing qualification demands, and adaptation skills. And jobs will disappear, even though Elisabetta will um, discuss that today with us. But that fact has already um, caused some considerate fear um, of technological unemployment. And the boundaries of what machines can do are further pushed day by day. Machines already replace large amounts of human workforce and are able to perform cognitive tasks that we thought would never be possible in the past. So we are coming closer to Matrix and we're coming closer to Star Wars bit by bit. But um, kidding aside, our panel today wants to contribute to the necess necessary, necessary, sorry about that, necessary debate concerning the future of work. We will look at how technological advances are changing um, within the economic structures of developing countries. We um, will look at how those countries are struggling to carve out the necessary resources that, will, um, that it takes to uh, react and benefit from the future of work trends. And two questions we have um, singled out, we will be discussing in particular, 
how our automation and other technology advances are changing the economic and social patterns in Asia and the develop in Asian developing countries, and how can governments, industry, and civil society organizations support their citizens with a different background and skill level to effectively manage those transitions, while we're also taking into account the social considerations. And this is a very important point that we will also make today. I have, thankfully so, three panelists uh, for you today for our one and a half hour session. And all three of um, whom you will be seeing today have done extensive amount of, amount of research on how the future of work could look like and what impact it will have on us. And we have Dr. Elisabetta Gentil from Asian Development Bank, usually in the Philippines, now stationed in Italy. And she will talk about how employment responds to the consumption to trade to technological advances in, in developing Asia. We have Dr. Christian Wiegelan from the International Labor Organization, ILIO. And Christian will discuss with us the policies and the strategies and the plans linked to technological changes to demographic shift and climate change in ASEAN countries and their main trading partners. And we have my dear colleague, Daniel Schmöcking. And Dr. Daniel Schmöcking will talk about the impact of digitalization on Cambodia's manufacturing industry and the approaches that policymakers could take in order to attain a most positive outcome for Cambodia. And exactly in that order we will start. I will not take away more time. So thank you once again, and I look forward, we all look forward to all of your presentations. So Elisabetta, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rabea. I am going to share my screen and uh, start the presentation. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it perfectly. Wonderful. Okay, so thank you very much. I don't think uh, there could have been a more timely session to discuss an issue that is only going to become more pressing and, and more of a priority as time moves on. Um, what I will discuss today is research that is freely available to anyone uh, on the Asian Development Bank website. Uh, it's the Asian Development Outlook 2018. And then amongst the many working papers that we produced uh, to, to support this publication, I chose one on global value chains, and I will explain later why. So the first thing that I would like to, to show is that we are currently in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. And as Rabea was mentioning uh, during her introduction, this has created a lot of anxiety uh, in the, on the labor markets uh, and fears that uh, technology is, is going to take away jobs. Well, the first thing we do is look at history. If there is a fourth industrial revolution, it means that we had a first, a second, and a third, right? And the patterns that we have noticed from, from history is that every single time a new disruptive technology came uh, to the market, it caused initial disruption, but every single time it resulted in increased worker productivity. Uh, what that suggests is that the new technology complemented uh, human workers and, and all together they increased productivity. So the question becomes, is this fourth industrial revolution different or is it the same? So if, if it's the same as what we saw before, the picture that you're looking at is a shoe factory. And what you see, you see human workers surrounded by technology, working side by side with technology. And that's precisely what we have seen historically that these new technologies have been deployed alongside workers and improved their productivity, increased their productivity. The anxiety comes from the second picture, uh, the idea that this is different, it's different this time, and that these technologies are going to pretty much eliminate the need for human workers. And I do like very much the name of the session today because it's really, while we tend to think that it's a physical technology, what we have to fear more is algorithms. Algorithms are those that are getting more and more complex and, uh, and they, are, they are the real threat uh, to, to human workers. So 
as uh, as Rabea was mentioning before, ADB research found several compelling reasons to remain optimistic about this situation. First and foremost, new technologies only automate some tasks of a job. Uh, what that means in general, and the example that I like to cite is the introduction of automated teller machines in banks. The, when, when ATMs were implemented, everybody thought this would be the end of the bank teller job. What ended up happening is that the deployment of ATMs freed up time and for, for bank employees to actually diversify and provide more complex services to, to, to customers. And the cost savings from this operation allowed banks to open more and more uh, branches. Uh, and so rather than the end of bank tellers as we know them, it just transformed, it changed, it enriched the job of bank teller. A second reason that we found is that technical feasibility of, of automating a certain task does not mean that it's going to be economically feasible to do so. Uh, in, certain, in, 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 in certain tasks, it's, it will be a long time before machines can, can perform uh, uh, equally as well as humans and, and beat the cost of humans at doing so. For specifically for developing Asia, what we, we found is that uh, there is a rising income and, and as, a, as such a rising consumer demand, an emerging new middle class. Uh, while you, we see consumer markets increasingly uh, saturated in developed economies, developing Asia is far away from, from reaching that point. Uh, so we have a lot of households that are buying their first refrigerator, they're buying their first washing machine. So this increase in demand can has the potential to compensate for the re reduced need for human workers from technology. And finally, what we, we see from history that every single time a new technology has been introduced, it has always created new industries and new occupations. So the anxiety that we see is simply due to the fact that we cannot predict what new jobs uh, will be created from technology. So the first thing we have to do, I'm sure most of you are already very familiar with this terminology, but in order to discuss uh, this issue, the fact that new technology only replace tasks and not necessarily entire jobs, it's important to familiarize ourselves with, with certain expressions that you will hear a lot throughout my presentation. So we break down uh, occupations uh, based on two categories. The first one is whether occupations are routine or non-routine. And you see that on the vertical axis of this box. Routine means, as it says right there, that it's prevailing predictable physical work involved uh, in, the, in the job. Non-routine means that the worker has to uh, respond to specific circumstances and decide which course of action to take. So the examples that we see here is uh, jobs where you have to deal with customer demands or we have to manage other people. The second category that we use to, to classify occupations is whether they are cognitive or they are manual. And you see that over the horizontal axis. So cognitive occupations, I think it's pretty much uh, uh, already uh, signified by the name, they require a certain level of skills and, 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 um, and also um, reasoning, logical, rational reasoning. Whereas uh, manual occupations, as the word itself suggests, uh, is, is, uh, re require working with one's hands. So if you look at this uh, box, you will see that historically the occupations that have been most attacked by, by technology have been the ones in box number two, routine manual occupations. Uh, those are the occupations where technology machines uh, can easily replace workers because we are talking about simple, predictable, repetitive tasks. 
Conversely, the occupations that are the traditionally have been more safer from, from technology have been the ones in box four, non-routine cognitive occupations. This is because they require rational, uh, logical thinking, they require human interaction, and again, the non-routine aspect of it is very important. The worker has to respond to external inputs and decide how to, uh, what course of action to take. Um, so, of course, with the fourth industrial revolution, certain aspects of non-routine cognitive jobs have also been automatable. Um, let's think, for example, uh, of uh, legal clerk type of tasks that now can be uh, produced, performed by algorithms, or some kind of medical services uh, that doctors and other healthcare professionals perform. So the, the non-routine cognitive occupations, which are traditionally were traditionally considered safe from automation, are now increasingly uh, part of it. So the first thing we wanted to see was where are these machines being deployed? So what you see in this graph is that the gray uh, histograms represent what the, what the employment share in total manufacturing of a certain sector is. Whereas the, gray, the green uh, histograms represent the, the fraction of robot sales. And you see a very interesting pattern emerge, even with this very simple approach. What you see is that the bulk of deployment of industrial robots is happening in industries that were already quite automated to begin with, that already had a lower employment share in total manufacturing. And what's, what are these sectors? I mean, the usual uh, culprits, electrical and electronics, automotive and metal. And as you can see, as you move to the right, the employment share increases, but the deployment of industrial robots decreases. So this is already telling us something that it seems to be that certain sectors that were already quite subject to automation are the ones that are continuing to automate. Whereas uh, sectors that were traditionally not uh, very automated are still not. Another exercise I did, this is only one graph from, from an, an entire working paper. So I'm going to have to condense a lot of information in one slide. Um, we wanted to, we split, we made a very simple split, the total occupations into routine and non-routine. And then we plotted that against the change in robot density. And as you can see, a very interesting pattern emerges that the routine employment is negatively and significantly correlated with um, uh, the change in increasing robot density. So as robot density increases, routine employment decreases. The, the plot to the right shows you the opposite, that as robot density increases, non-routine employment increases as well. Again, a simple approach, it's suggesting us something interesting, that non-routine jobs complement technologies. Uh, whereas routine employment is very substitutable. Now, uh, I would like to focus on one uh, working paper, one uh, research project in particular. And why? Because developing Asia and the history of getting people out of poverty in developing Asia is very closely related to participation in global value chains. Um, so we thought it was very important to look at how technology, technological advances and introduction of new technologies are going to affect these patterns of employment along global value chains. So here, what you see is a super simple, simplified version of a, a textile value chain from, from uh, growing, uh, ginning and trade all the way to uh, manufacture garments and, 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 and exported and, and sold to stores. So there are two potential impacts that technology can have on, on employment along global value chains. The first one is task relocation. So if you have a Chinese garments manufacturer that decides to outsource some jobs, for example, to Cambodia, considering holding everything else equal, 
you will see some jobs shift from China to Cambodia in that particular task along the global value chain. If instead I, if we introduce, for example, in step three, we introduce a machine that automatically cuts garments. So you don't need workers to manually cut garments anymore. What does that do? Well, uh, if you don't need the workers to cut the garments anymore, those workers will disappear on that particular task from the value chain. Now, where is that this gets complicated? Is that task relocation and technology within GVCs, they often go hand in hand in the sense that when a manufacturer wants to relocate production, it's also a very good time to reevaluate the production process and the production technology. Hence, for example, the fear that many developing Asian countries have of a phenomenon called reshoring, where their labor cost advantage is completely eroded by the, av the availability of new technology, which makes uh, manufacturers relocate, brands relocate production close to the customer base. So how do we go about this? Well, we undergo this complex, uh, uh, but really insightful um, accounting exercise. So if you look at that orange circle in the middle, it shows you the total change in employment between 2008 and 2017, in 2018 in a sample of developing Asian economies that represent 98% of total employment in developing Asia. So we couldn't get them all, but we got pretty close. So you can see that between 2008 and 2018, there were a total of 12 million new jobs created. So what we did, we decomposed uh, these jobs uh, to this change into, along three uh, categories, changes within GVCs, changes between GVCs, and changes in income and demand. So let's begin with changes within GVCs. Changes within GVCs uh, represent anything that alters the production structure and therefore the demand for workers. You can have three further decompositions, technology within GVCs and task relocation, which is what I just explained. And then of course, the country level efficiency. For example, if there is a country that still experiences rolling blackouts, that's gonna have an effect on, on the efficiency of workers. So what do we find if you, if you look at changes in employment within GVCs, holding everything else constant? The technology within GVC by itself would have been associated with a, change, with a decrease in employment of 46% there is 74 million jobs lost. The task relocation uh, actually uh, remained pretty much stable. There were 50,000 new jobs from task relocation, but it's really a very small, uh, like it's close to zero in terms of task relocation. And then country level efficiency, you can see that holding everything constant, improvements in country level efficiency result in 12 million fewer jobs. So this is a very sobering finding, right? That if you hold everything else constant, technology would basically make 74 million jobs disappear between 2008 and 2018. Now, if we shift, if we move our attention to between GVCs, this is when consumer preferences shift from one type of product to another. Uh, so this is, for example, if you think about your lockdown experience, I am pretty sure that your consumption patterns changed. And this is something that would be reflected in a, a shifts in employment between GVCs. As you can see, holding everything constant, shifts uh, or consumer preferences would have resulted by themselves in a 14 million jobs being lost. But finally, and this is the part that I really want you to pay attention to, we have decomposed effects from income and consumer demand between own country and rest of the world demand. And as you can see, own country is basically by itself is able to countervail, to counterbalance the loss in employment coming from the deployment of new technologies. 
uh, and then demand from the rest of the world is also associated by itself holding everything else constant uh, with 7 million new jobs being created. So this shows you that in developing Asia, rising income and demand is a strong driver for employment. And we are far from uh, having saturated consumer markets, especially in certain developing Asian countries, we are a long way to go uh, between, uh, before that happens. I want to show you the same decomposition, but this time we chose a sample of countries that are particularly, that have a GVC, a, a global value chain involvement. And as you can see, pretty much across the board, technology within GDCs is associated with a decrease in employment. Task relocation is a bit of a mixed bag, and we know that, you know, all in all, it's pretty much zero. It stays where it was. And then income from the rest of the world and from own country, as you can see, across the board, a very strong driver of employment. Okay, so an important element that I mentioned before is that technology creates new occupations and new industries. And in order to do this, we chose three uh, developing Asian economies, Malaysia, the Philippines, and India. We looked at their latest national occupations and then, uh, sorry, national classifications of occupations and compare them with the earlier version. And what we found across the board is new occupations being added to these classifications. And they are all pretty much concentrated into a ICT, architecture and software, and then a medical field. And, uh, some of them you can see for all three countries and some of them specifically for India or specifically for Malaysia. So what that suggests to us is that uh, already you can see the birth of new occupations that are being added to the national classifications. Um, and again, we cannot predict what is going to be because this, is, this depends on new technologies being introduced. I'm sure 30 years ago, nobody would know what uh, a cybersecurity expert uh, is and what they even do. And now they are some of the most sought after uh, profiles uh, in the world. Again, as you can see, most occupations of most of the new occupations are non-routine cognitive occupations. Well, as you, another uh, simple analysis that we made was to analyze annual growth in employment of wage workers broken down by routine manual and uh, non-routine cognitive. And again, it's pretty clear to see that non-routine cognitive occupations are growing across the board, whereas manual occupations are shrinking uh, across the board. Same story for uh, wages. Wages are very important because in developing Asia, we are all about getting people out of poverty. And we do that by paying living wages. And as you can see, except for Vietnam, which is a special case, uh, you can see that wage growth for non-routine cognitive occupation far outpaced wage growth for manual occupations. And then we asked ourselves the question, well, we cannot predict what is going to be, what kind of occupations are going to be needed in Asia, in developing Asia in 10 years. But what we can do, we can compare the structure of employment in developing Asia to the OECD average to see how would the structure of employment in developing Asia have to change if it were to look similar to the OECD in the next 10 years or so. And as you can see, the light pink bars shows you show you that we would have to have a significant shrinkage in manual occupations. And the blue bars show you that we would have to have a significant growth in non-routine cognitive occupations. Now, the issue is that this, there is already a talent shortage that is acutely felt in the Asia Pacific region. As you can see, beginning in 2008, uh, Asia Pacific became uh, higher than the global average in terms of talent shortage. So this is only going to get worse if no significant policy action is taken. So what we recommend is a, a 
360 degree approach. As you can see, specialized skills, the ones that relate to a specific job or task or skill are only the tip of the pyramid. If we really want to create workers that have occupational mobility, they are able to learn to relearn. It has to start with foundational skills that are learned to, through ba basic education and transversal skills that are learned both in education and in, throughout a series of life experiences. So we cannot just focus on the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the pyramid because by the time people get to the tip, their ability to learn to relearn has already been decided. Quite a, uh, there is, you know, it's something that has to gr be grown and stimulated from the very early childhood. And this is a policy message that we are trying to pass across multiple platforms uh, and in multiple contexts. Unfortunately, the global trend seems to be going in the opposite direction, at least when it comes to specialized skills. Unfortunately, it's really hard. Uh, data on developing Asia is really hard to come by. As you can see, the o this OECD research from 2016 uh, only has Japan and Australia from the Asia Pacific region. But what it shows you is that both public spending on worker training and public spending on labor market has been decreasing pretty much across the board. Um, this is a serious problem. And unfortunately, employers are cutting back too. Again, data from developing Asia is incredibly hard to come by. This is a study on the United States. I doubt that a developing Asia would be doing much better than that. What tends to happen is that during recessions and crisis, the employee training budget is the first one to get slashed, and then it never is brought back to the way it was. So we are, this is a serious crisis that we are facing, especially given the context of, of the transformation of the labor market that we are facing. So here is what I want to conclude by, by repeating that it is simplistic at best to say that technology is displacing jobs. Uh, especially for developing Asia, what we are noticing is that productivity gains and strong consumer demands are creating many more jobs than they are being displaced by technology. This doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything about it because there is not potential for infinite growth from consumer demand. Sooner or later, this avenue for growth will be completely uh, uh, um, eliminated as well. But the new jobs created requires different skill set. So both, both government and business have a pivotal role to play in fostering occupational mobility. I think from everything I say, I said, these are really the two messages that I want to, to emphasize. Um, and with that, I conclude my presentation and I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you very much, Elisabetta, for this fantastic presentation. We enjoyed every word of it and you left us with a, a round of questions where we scratch our head on and you gave us a rather optimistic outlook even though in the later stage in our discussion rounds, I would like to come back to the skill shift because I don't see governments and businesses yet hand in hand. And I think that our governments on either side have already um, defined what kind of different education it will place, um, it will take to really place our youngsters, our next generations um, for this change. I would like to point out um, because I haven't done this before, that you are working on the new studies of what drives innovation in Asia, in Asia and we are very, very much looking forward uh, to those findings as well. I would uh, like to go on now to Christian Bigelhan. Uh, Christian's uh, research focus is on trade, global supply chains and labor markets within the ELO. And he joins us now from the Bangkok office. Is that right, Christian? Yes, yes. good morning, everyone. Bangkok. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yours. Yes, we can hear you very well. So please. Okay, okay great. So let me share the screen with you. Can you see it? Yes. I'll just go in slideshow mode. Good. Up. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Elisabetta already has, uh, has mentioned that um, obviously, uh, the world of work is experiencing um, 
major uh, changes. And I mean, this was the case already before uh, COVID uh, now, now hit the global economy. The changes in terms of technological change, environmental change, and also aging in, in this region is, is important. It's an important trend to consider. And of course, uh, all these trends, they have not uh, gone away. But obviously now, like, uh, I mean, there are so many webinars and events organized on, on COVID. And I do think also it is important uh, to consider the, the current context. So I'm going to start with that. So we at the ILO, we have actually estimated, um, produced some estimates of the impact of COVID on, this, uh, cr on, on, the, on the labor market in this region and globally as well. And, uh, you know, obviously there are lots of uncertainties, but... Um, what we have actually focused on is uh, working hours that have been lost due to this crisis. So um, what we have been seeing is actually like a dramatic loss in working hours. So globally, when we look at uh, 2020 quarter two, um, we see that 14% of working hours have been lost and the numbers are very, very similar in the Asia Pacific region. And also if you focus more narrowly on uh, Southeast Asia. And of course, the Asia Pacific region was already the region that was very hard hit in the in the first quarter. So what does that mean? I mean, just like uh, to get a bit of an idea. Um, so this uh, working time losses. Um, so basically, they correspond to uh, this global losses in the second quarter. That is, these uh, global losses in working time correspond to the working time of 400 million full time workers. And when I say full time workers, I mean, uh, workers uh, working 48 hours per week. So this is really a huge uh, number. I mean, it doesn't mean that 400 million jobs are lost. I mean, some of the jobs are lost, but um, um, also a reason why we don't focus really on, on unemployment is that in a lot of cases, actually you have uh, workers that work simply less than they would like to and less than they would than they were used to um, associated with uh, with obviously income losses and uh, of course um, the the whole impact is not only through unemployment especially given that we have actually a large informal sector in this region so three out of four workers in asia pacific are actually in the in the informal economy and um, those uh, workers might not actually now be in unemploy in unemployment according to the strict statistical definition but of course they are still uh, hit very harshly. So this is the situation in which we now are in. But obviously, these uh, bigger trends, they have not gone away. And I think they are uh, even uh, getting a push. So I think there's for sure a push uh, towards a rep more rapid technological change, uh, digitalization. I think there's also a bit of a push um, yeah, to intensify efforts to combat uh, climate change and environmental uh, change. And also, um, obviously, the, the um, demographic change uh, is uh, still there. So this is nothing that, uh, that, is, uh, that is changing. So now what, what we have done is actually, we have actually um, produced about a year ago, actually, a report on um, policies that uh, countries in this uh, region, in ASEAN uh, plus six, so ASEAN and their main trading partners, have been implementing or, or are, which policies are in their planning documents uh, to basically um, prepare their labor markets for these changes. So first question that we asked is actually, uh, does a country actually have a plan um, to related to technological change, industry 4.0, digitalization, demographic change, and environmental change? How does a country seek to prepare the labor market for these changes? And what are the roles of social partners and the private sectors in the design of these strategies and uh, plans? So we focus on ASEAN uh, plus six, I mentioned that. Um, and uh, let me start now with the uh, technological change. So um, before going into the policies, um, I think it's worth actually also to look you know, like what are the expectations and trends and perceptions about technology in this region. And we found actually a, a quite uh, interesting uh, survey that was actually published in the in a public in the report of the World Economic Forum, where um, young people were actually asked, um, "Do you expect, um, yeah, technology to actually increase the number of jobs, reduce the number of jobs, or not have actually any impact?" And what is really interesting is that obviously there is a huge amount of optimism in this region what uh, technology can do for for job creation. And uh, what is also interesting, if you look at the chart on the right hand side, that actually those 
with uh, lower levels of education. So those with uh, no schooling or um, elementary and secondary schooling, um, they actually are more optimistic about actually what uh, technology will uh, bring to the labor market than those um, with the higher levels of education. But still the general, uh, I mean, the, I think there is a strong sense of optimism. And another evidence uh, or some more evidence for this optimism is um, when you look at actually news articles um, that, uh, yeah, that mention terms like artificial intelligence, uh, digitalization, industry 4.0. So there is a, a G-Delta database, which actually looks at all uh, online news articles uh, that are published. So this is like a, a database built up on the basis of, of big data. And then we have actually um, looked at that and done some analysis, like uh, picking out news articles, exactly mentioning those terms. And then uh, um, this uh, big data analysis uh, is basically an analysis of uh, whether the, the terminology used in those news articles uh, is overwhelmingly positive. If so, if there are like words with a positive tone uh, that are used, so like uh, job creation, uh, optimism are, are positive words, or whether the article is rather negative, which would be like job losses or uh, like pessimistic outlook. So then, I mean, an article would be classified as one with a negative tone. What we really see is that news reporting in this region has really been extremely positive about the technological changes. So there's a lot of optimism, but also lots of expectations actually what technology will bring or can bring. So now um, policies, so I will not, uh, I, I don't have the time to really go country by country or to go much in, in detail, but we have kind of like tried to classify uh, different types of policies that we have been seeing uh, in the plans um, of uh, countries in ASEAN and their trading partners. So first uh, element or first type of policies that we see is really, I mean, there's a strong focus on skills development for technological upgrading. So there's a lot of emphasis on skills development for uh, so-called uh, or development of so-called STEM skills. So science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics. And also there are some countries that really have put in place like certain uh, targets even. So for example, Malaysia um, in its plan uh, yeah, aims to raise the share of high skilled workers in manufacturing from 18%, I think in 2016 to 35% in 2025. Or Thailand in its 20 year national strategy aims to basically support 12,000 doctor researchers that support the 10 industries that have been identified as key industries under Thailand 4.0. So you really see uh, that there has been a lot of focus actually on this uh, high skilled uh, segment to focus uh, or to try to basically close the skills shortages. Then there's also like a, uh, yes, uh, very, very often or frequently mentioned uh, the policies uh, on vocational education for skilling, reskilling and upskilling. So countries are developing, for example, new certification systems for people that uh, want to do on the, on the job training or, or want to basically yeah, develop uh, high skills in their particular field so that uh, programs are being uh, developed and a lot of those program programs are developed uh, online as well. Then uh, many countries actually they have I didn't they have uh, put in place sector specific skills roadmaps because obviously it's like uh, the issue of skills is like very or can be very sector specific uh, dependent on what the particular sector uh, has identified as skills shortage and then um, yeah so there is a roadmap to to close that uh, skills gap. There's also a bit of mentioning of uh, lifelong learning. So that's uh, the idea that uh, obviously learning does not end uh, after uh, finishing school or university, but uh, there is actually a need to remain flexible uh, to basically enhance the skills throughout the, the working lives, throughout the, the career. And finally, also some countries have are making tremendous efforts of attracting high skilled uh, talent, often coming, uh, yeah, also coming from abroad. So even uh, some countries are discussing actually, um, yeah, um, some uh, favorable income tax rules for incoming uh, migrants that uh, that can fill some of the skills shortages in certain sectors, and uh, I think there is a bit of uh, evidence that countries are uh, trying to compete actually for the best uh, talent worldwide. But because okay, so all in all, I think I mean there is a lot on skills, which I think is understandable. But uh, there is a lot of emphasis actually on the high-skilled uh, end of uh, of uh, human resources. Um, 
So now, um, I mean, Elisabetta uh, Elizabeth has mentioned it as well. Um, I think uh, generally there is perhaps uh, not necessarily a reason to assume that, you know, like in the long term, um, you know, like uh, we will only be uh, served by robots and uh, there is no work anymore for the humans. But I think it is also a consensus that I think in the short term, technological disruption can uh, yeah, create um, some problems for, for some workers that uh, simply need to move to a different type of job, move perhaps the sector, um, apart from obviously the, the changes uh, of uh, yeah, within the job itself, moving towards more uh, non-routine cognitive uh, tasks. But there is a bit of disruption, but uh, what we have noticed is that countries are not really uh, talking uh, about that a lot so i mean there's a bit of uh, mentioning of this in the in the plan of cambodia for example so they men mentioned that the government has to manage the adverse effects caused by the industrial revolution that include the changing style of, of doing business and job losses um, but generally um, there's little discussion also about you know like how to support actually um, these uh, these moves of workers from one to another sector apart from of course uh, mentioning skills development but I think there is a bit of a tendency to kind of like uh, uh, unrealistically uh, present on what is actually feasible because I don't really think that out of a uh, cashier in the supermarket you will be very quickly or easily make a software engineer or out of a taxi driver you will be like a, you will make like a digital content creator or something like this. So I think uh, partially they are a bit of like a very high and perhaps unrealistic uh, expectation of what is feasible. Okay, so this is let's say in a nutshell about uh, technological uh, disruption, what countries have been doing. Now um, let me focus on aging. Um, and obviously this is also related to technology because I think technology can provide some solutions as well. Um, to the challenges associated with aging. And uh, first of all, what I would like to emphasize is that aging is really an issue in actually all the ASEAN plus six countries that we have been focusing on. So for all these countries, actually we have been seeing um, an increase in the median age of the labor force. And uh, we are also expecting actually uh, a further increase uh, of the age um, of the median age in the future. So this is a very, very relevant uh, topic here. Um, so how are countries going about preparing their labor market um, for an aging population? So a lot of countries are uh, focusing on prolonging actually the working lives of, of elderly. So this is done by increasing the, the manda mandatory retirement age. Also in some instances, countries are giving, for example, subsidies uh, for, especially for elderly people to um, set up a business. So it's not only through the retirement age uh, that uh, working lives are, are aiming to be prolonged. Then again, you have uh, lifelong learning, access to training for older workers, or even like uh, some countries are op opening up their universities, uh, are promoting uh, older people to actually go to universities, attend university programs, which I think is, is a quite interesting approach. Then also there is, a, a, of course, the, the question of aging uh, raises uh, questions in relation to um, yeah, uh, skills or, or skills supply in the area of the care sector. So there again, um, can, some countries are actually focusing on uh, migration as a solution to, to tackle those uh, challenges, uh, to find uh, workers in the, in the care sector, health care, elderly care. I think Japan is, I think, uh, one of the examples um, where actually the country has opened up uh, to migration into some sectors. And one of the sectors is also the, the care sector. There's lots of uh, uh, attention paid on uh, offering digital solutions uh, to help uh, elderly uh, workers actually being integrated into the labor market. So for example, um, um, some countries focus on uh, making sure that uh, uh, there are uh, user-friendly uh, interfaces uh, of technological devices uh, that uh, are particularly um, easy to use also for, for older workers. And generally, there is the idea to have a more flexible approach, um, working from home, part-time work, and I guess also these uh, current challenges, the COVID crisis is kind of supporting uh, this uh, development. But there is very much like 
all in all, a summary on uh, tr in a summary, I think there is a lot of emphasis on actually keeping the elderly longer in in, in employment. And then finally, uh, climate change. So, what are countries uh, doing about that to to prepare the labor markets for it? So, uh, I mean, uh, there is obviously the renewable energy sector has been growing. Um, obviously, it's not perhaps the sector that will create many jobs, but uh, I think the number of jobs in that sector, nevertheless, will be will be growing. And uh, yeah. Um, is uh, so, so I mean a certain number of workers is already working in this sector in different countries of the region. Um, in a summary, what are what are countries uh, doing? So um, there are on the one hand policies to address climate change and job creation. So there is a lot of talk about job creation in the green sector, in the green economy, and obviously this requires again a, a certain skill set. So there is emphasis on skills for green jobs. But it's also very much focused actually on skills for those that already have a very good education, so those that are high skilled. And also countries are implementing some, um, yeah, some assistance schemes for those workers that are adversely affected by climate change, in particular uh, in the agricultural sector. So uh, apologize. Uh, so these are uh, kind of um, yeah, support schemes or, or assistance schemes in case uh, the harvest is, is affected uh, by climate change or by natural disasters. So countries have been doing something about that. But again, all in all, I think this, the emphasis is very much on skills development. So now, you know, like what are the takeaways or what were our takeaways uh, after looking at those uh, strategies? I think, one thing that is important to recognize is that I think the future work is not high skilled alone. And I mean, when you look at those documents, you, you get a bit of an impression that, uh, you know, like everybody in the, in the future, all the, the jobs that will be needed in the future are high skilled jobs. For sure, I mean, the, the share of uh, non-routine cognitive uh, occupations or, or jobs where you need those, those kind of skills is, is increasing. But we also have a very large share still of, uh, of workers uh, that don't actually bring along that education background. And I think this tends to be a bit overlooked. And um, as I mentioned before, the plans to reskill uh, some of the workforce is uh, tends to be unrealistic. And otherwise, there's a lot of focus really on those uh, that are probably in uh, mostly living in urban areas. Um, maybe already actually having a, a, a well-paid job actually. To, uh, so it's those uh, to which those uh, skills development programs are mostly actually targeted. And uh, this is just something also to recognize that actually it's actually just a sh very small share of the population. And then the question is obviously, what do you do with the other large uh, share? And currently, you know, like where, where are we standing? Um, so this is, uh, uh, so there we have actually classified uh, occupations according to their uh, skill levels. And I mean, it just gives a rough picture, but we still see that actually in many countries of the region and overall, for example, in ASEAN, the share of uh, workers in high skilled occupations currently stands at almost at uh, nearly 15%, which is actually very low. I mean, that's obviously one of the reasons why countries try to increase that share. But I don't think that from today to tomorrow, um, all the 85% the uh, other people or other uh, people in other jobs are actually going to move into that uh, high skilled uh, job uh, area. Then I think another thing that is a little bit of lacking in those plans is that, you know, like these uh, changes, uh, they are, they will cause some disruptions. They will cause uh, force workers to move to, to encounter, uh, to, to do some transitions in their working life. And uh, you know, like there's, I think, um, very much emphasis on, uh, on, uh, yeah, basically focusing on the positive aspect of technology, but I think also it would be good if governments kind of like uh, would recognize that at least in the short term, technology can cause some disruptions. Um, and I think it's a, there is a need to recognize that you need to do something to support workers uh, making those transitions. And this is, I think, especially relevant when thinking about social protection uh, in this region, because in uh, Southeast Asia and ASEAN, actually, it's it's a case that um, two thirds of the of uh, the population is not covered by any scheme of uh, social protection, which of course then causes an issue if uh, workers have to move job from one to another, because often these 
job uh, moves are not uh, smooth. And then finally, what we have seen um, is, uh, yeah, you know, like we have looked at how have countries, you know, like develop those plans and strategies. And there's a lot of emphasis in collaborating with, with business. And I think it is absolutely important, you know, like to understand what are the needs of business, what are the skills shortages that particular sectors are uh, encountering. But at the same time, uh, I mean, all these changes don't only affect business, but they affect other parts of the society as well. So I think uh, there is, uh, it is important to actually also bring other stakeholders on board including uh, workers and including other parts of the civil society in order to achieve what we at the ILO uh, um, call the human-centered agenda, because this is the agenda that actually our constituents, which are governments, workers, and employer associations uh, in uh, among uh, ILO member states have actually agreed to in June 2019. So there has been a centenary uh, declaration um, where actually countries uh, kind of commit uh, yeah, to a uh, human-centered uh, future of work. And uh, I think it's simply important to have this dialogue uh, um, with all parts of, of the society, including uh, business and employers, but also including uh, workers. So uh, all this uh, you find actually uh, in, uh, in a report that uh, I mentioned that in the beginning was published around a year ago. Um, and uh, also, if you're interested on the work that ILO has been doing on assessing actually the impact of COVID on the labor market, then uh, you are more than welcome in, in uh, clicking on those uh, links here. And uh, also, in case of any questions, uh, I mean, obviously, there will be a Q&A part after, after this presentations, but also feel free to, to contact me. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Christian, for your very enlightening um, presentation. Um, I have taken away uh, your call uh, for governments to reach out to stakeholders and to finally start a dialogue. And I think this is not only a dialogue that has to be held within one country, but I think it is across national and uh, okay. it's time for uh, maybe even the ASEAN uh, to look at that issues and to maybe have a comprehensive holistic approach to this. Um, I also have taken away your um, hint to low-skilled laborers, and I think we will see a problem here in the future because we have a number of low-skilled laborers still, and the shifts are too fast to really uh, bring them into new jobs and to, to adjust education. Okay. So I think we are also have to talk at some point about um, civilization divide between those highly skilled, trained, good educated um, young generations and those who are simply left behind because they cannot adapt to the to the changing um, labor market because the skills okay. are not enough, their own or the secondary skills. You have also pointed out a very interesting collide of um, development that we, in, in some countries, industrialized countries, especially in Asia, you pointed out Japan, we have the problem of elderly um, workers. I, Nowadays, we read about the, the retirement age being pushed up to 80, dwindling numbers. And uh, in other countries, down south in Southeast Asia, you have a young generation with uh, less and less prospects um, to find a decent job. So we have to talk about migration. Um, okay. Maybe we can discuss that out in uh, the discussion to come. I would like to come now to our third speaker to Daniel. And before I hand over the mic to him, I like to encourage everyone listening, either in our YouTube stream or in our chat box, uh, in, in our Zoom rooms, please leave your questions on, in, on the chat boxes, either at Zoom or on the YouTube, we will be collecting them. So start sending them now, because uh, we will then hand them straight to um, our speakers. So Daniel, floor is yours. You have been leading our Cambodia office for quite a while now, and I'm very, very thankful for the study you put on because you are giving us sort of a laboratory study how the technology changing really impact one single sector in one single country. You have not just been uh, forecast in Cambodia, but also in Mongolia, and um, you can probably all pull your experiences together. Um, that you have made probably quite similar on that subject. So please, the floor is yours, Daniel. Yeah, thank you very much. And good morning from Phnom Penh. 
uh, I think it's quite a difficult task for me now because a lot of things are already said and I try to not repeat a lot of things. And um, I try to take a different perspective uh, because I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm a political scientist and I'm more interested in the question, how can policymakers and governments shape this global trends uh, that were already described by Lisa Vetta and by Christian. Um, yeah. Um, so I will talk a bit about this global industrial developments, but I keep it short because this is the part that is already mentioned. Then I will talk about the Cambodian economy and where is the weaknesses. And I think this is similar to a lot of different, to, to a lot of other countries here in the region. Um, especially uh, with countries that um, have a, a big manufacturing sector. Um, here in Cambodia, it's garment. Um, so then I will talk a bit about this future outlook, what will happen or what could happen with these jobs. And um, I would describe um, some scenarios that I think are, um, you have to be aware of. Um, and this is also government uh, focused and then at the end, um, I will discuss a bit um, what should be done um, uh, to get the best outcome, especially when it comes to developing countries and in particular Cambodia. Um, I mean, the global industrial developments were already described. We are um, in the fourth industrial revolution. And th that means especially that factories are not just being automated, that factories are really um, communicating with each other and that the human factor in producing goods will be reduced. Um, and that leads to this question of reshoring. And um, we don't know what will happen. I think a big factor is uh, at the end, um, if robots are cheaper than the, the, um, the labor costs, then um, the production will move more to the consumer markets. That's nothing we can avoid. Um, the question is when it will happen and how it will happen. Um, I will skip this. Um, I will more focus now on the different sectors. So the question is, what is the impact? And there's a lot of discussion about it. What will happen? How, how much time do we have? Uh, how big is the, 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 the impact? When it comes to manufacturing, um, Deloitte predicts that um, we have time, so um, until the impact uh, comes, but the impact will be huge. So developing countries with a huge manufacturing sector, they have to be prepared. Um, and then it's again, the question, what will happen to these jobs? Um, we talked about it, high skilled jobs, they will probably benefit from machines, from computers, um, those who have this high cognitive skills. The medium skilled workers, they are more in competition with with computers and technology and this low skill jobs there are at high risk of being automated. Um, and you, we already see these trends in the garment sector. Um, um, the, the companies who produce, they already say that um, in 2025, 60% uh, uh, of the, the, the decisions made when it comes to uh, 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 sourcing um, will be affected by automation and not so much by labor costs anymore. Um, and, and that would mean that um, the, the factor of low labor costs that draw the garment factor in countries like Cambodia or Myanmar um, will be um, affected a lot. And then this question of reshoring to, to the markets in uh, the US or in Europe will appear. So the Cambodian economy. It's, it's quite a success story. Um, we have seen a rapid development in Cambodia and not just in manufacturing and in garment. Here you see a picture, it's the capital Phnom Penh in the year 2010 and then nine years later. And this is symbolic. So we have a rapid development, um, sometimes not a politically proper planned, uh, um, but it happened. Um, but the question is, what, what will happen in the future? Because at the moment, a lot of the success was possible because of these low labor costs uh, and the garment industry. And um, 
value chains that moved out of China, um, where the end product was manufactured here in Cambodia. That was also um, important or one benefit was that Cambodia had this duty-free access to the European market, to the US market, um, which is changing at the moment. Uh, you, we talked about, uh, you probably heard about the decision of the European Union to withdraw the EBA, the everything but arms status for Cambodia. So this benefit will go um, in the future. Um, and then the question is, how can this whole economy react to this? Um, the, the problem is um, the Cambodian labor market is, um, yeah, it has a lack of, uh, of skilled workers. Uh, it, has, um, it has a lack um, of um, being competitive. It has a lack of automation. Um, um, and that is, uh, that is a problem. And this reduction in workers, um, some one machine uh, is re replacing 20 workers. Um, it's also happening in the garment sector. It's probably slower than in other industries um, that are already highly automated. Um, Lisa better mentioned it, like uh, the, the car industry or something else. Um, but these effects will come. And it's just a question, again, if when robots are cheaper, than the existing manufacturing processes. Um, and there is a high dependence in Cambodia on the garment sector. 33% um, of the GDP, um, 800,000 workers um, are there. Um, the, the, um, let's say the, 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 the salaries are good in Cambodia, which is good for the workers. Uh, but when you compare to other countries um, who have a big garment sector like uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar, um, uh, Cambodia is losing competitiveness because of that. And um, that is also a risk. I mean, we know that the garment sector can move very, very quick. Um, they, um, they produce um, where they have the lowest uh, costs. And that is a big problem for Cambodia. Um, in general, um, the Cambodian economy has some advantages. 50% um, of the population is younger than 25 years. Um, this is on one hand a big opportunity because um, this is a young workforce. Uh, when it's well educated, it can um, really help to develop the country. But if you don't have the proper jobs for those millions of workers that will enter the, 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 the labor market, then um, um, it, it's not so easy for them. Um, and I'm not so sure, I'm not so optimistic if the, the, Cam, um, the, the Cambodian labor market can um, integrate all these young um, Cambodians. Um, and at the same time, uh, um, over 4 million people are in risk of automation. That is from a study from the ILO. Um, they did a, you did a study on the risk of automation in ASEAN, um, based also on this model of Frey, Frey and Osborne. Um, and here, uh, Cambodia doesn't look so good. So what will happen? What are the different scenarios? Um, so you have on the one hand the factor of labor costs, and on the other hand, uh, the level of automation. Um, I would talk about these scenarios um, a bit more in detail, but in general, at the moment, we have a scenario where we have a low level of automation in Cambodia and low labor costs. Um, which is the best scenario is when you come to a point where you have these high skilled workers um, and they can work with machines, they can be part of this automation integration industry 4.0 process. Um, the other scenarios, um, when you have high labor costs and low level of automation, the, the, the garment sector will just leave, will move to another country. And uh, the scenario three is more this transition to get there to a scenario four. Um, I think it's important for a country like Cambodia to think about this. Um, 
a lot when, when I talk to policymakers here, some people say we have to reshift anyway. We have, government is not a future industry. Um, we need to focus on other things. But the point is those jobs, you cannot replace them overnight. And um, you, you, and I think at the end, um, you don't have an alternative then to create a working ecosystem around the garment industry. Um, try to make it competitive, make it um, competitive for the future, create high skill jobs, um, create uh, education opportunities, um, and then other things, other sectors will follow. Um, but um, it is already here, the garment sector, and I think it's worth to develop. So I will come now to the scenarios. So the first one, that's what I already said. So that's basically the status quo. Um, there, the Cambodian labor market is competitive uh, through cheap labor. At the moment, there is low investment in automation um, and the wages are not getting higher. That will means um, as long as um, producing with robots is not cheaper than this business model, um, the sector will stay in Cambodia. And as long as there are no lower salaries somewhere else, the sector will stay in Cambodia. Um, but this is a bit unrealistic because of these global trends we described um, and also the, the contribution to Cambodia's wealth and growth will be limited in this scenario. So I would say you cannot rely on the status quo. You have to develop the sector if you are a decision maker. Um, the other scenario is because of this rising wages and the low investment um, in automation, the, the sector is losing its uh, competitiveness. Um, and then also means the, the garment production caravan is moving to another country. Um, some small businesses will stay for local consumption, but that would mean that Cambodia will lose a lot of jobs and um, there will be very limited contribution to the Cambodian GDP. Third scenario is this transi uh, transition period to get to the best outcome. So that means while wages are still comparably low, the investment in automation is already high. It's, it's getting high and you, you have this movement um, to, to a high-skilled, high-technology garment sector. In this scenario, the, the workers need to be educated. They need to catch up quickly um, because they have to be able to work with machines. They also have to be able to communicate in English um, with um, their, their bosses. Um, and if, if this, this is a crucial period, um, but it can, I think, be successful to uh, come to the to the, to the best scenario in automated garment sector that um, creates at the same, I mean, it creates the same amount of jobs because more production would move here. Um, and um, that means the, the contribution for the Cambodian GDP can be high, will be still high. Um, and at the same time, you, you create a lot of high skilled workers that are also able to work in different factories that might also move to Cambodia when investment decisions also in the car industry and uh, in, in industries that um, demand higher skilled workers um, could move to Cambodia. And that's why I think at the end, it's worth to considering developing the garment sector instead of just saying they will leave it. So that's my, my personal take on this. The question is how to get there um, and how, how to do, if, if it, the, this question, is it necessary to develop the sector uh, at all? Um, and I think there is at the end, no immediate replacement for this low skill jobs. So you cannot just say, um, be, be, we don't care about the sector anymore. It will leave anyway and uh, we find replacement for these jobs. That will not happen. And I think that um, you will have a lot of spillover effects when you have a high tech, high skill garment sector uh, to other sectors. And um, at the end, Cambodia still has time to develop the sector because the advantage of 
the cheap labor will also not disappear overnight. Um, so that's why I think it's um, worthwhile to uh, think about developing this sector. So how to get there? At the end, I would say the, the, the big factors for economic development are more or less still the same also in the digital age and all this. So it's education, education, infrastructure, and infrastructure. And here we need we need to say that um, because of this economic success of Cambodia in the last years, um, there was not enough investment in education and there was not enough investment in infrastructure. And it is high time to do it now um, because the risks are too high. And yeah, when it comes to education, I think um, the, the, the universities have to upgrade. Uh, there is at the moment basically no vocational training in um, Cambodia. There are small initiatives in the garment sector um, from the uh, Garment Manufacturers Association, um, but um, there needs to be a lot more done. And I would also say <clears throat> that the universities, they have to shift from teaching from just teaching institutions to research institutions. That is what we see here. We have a lot of universities, we have no vocational training and the universities are taking over more or less the job of the vocational training, but then there's no money um, in, in research. And that um, is problematic because universities with a big research focus can also create other businesses, other jobs, creative people, um, and that will lead to a lot of opportunities. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, yes, roads, rails, ports, airports are still very important. Um, the only thing I would say, not the only thing, but the one crucial thing that changed in, in, in the digital age is that you also have to invest in fast, reliable, and affordable internet. Um, and here in Cambodia, the good story is Cambodia already has the cheapest mobile internet prices in the world, um, but broadband uh, is still not that good and not reliable here. And there needs to be more investment in, in all these um, infrastructure. Um, I also think it needs uh, balanced investment, um, not just China, I think, um, for Cambodia, it's very important to bring also other actors in. Um, and uh, yeah, and, um, another thing that Cambodia um, will probably do, Cambodia will probably be one of the first countries who have um, 5G um, here in the region. Um, the, um, the, because the, the, the mobile sector is quite developed here. So other things um, besides education and infrastructure is the question of energy, reliable, affordable energy. And here also Cambodia has a lot to do. Um, the the um, energy costs of Cambodia are the highest in ASEAN. Um, and, um, and there's a strong reliance on neighboring countries for energy imports. Um, here, Cambodia also needs a lot of investment, um, especially in renewable energies, um, and that um, will make, at the end, Cambodia more competitive. Um, then the question of value chains, um, I already touched it. Um, I think it's crucial for Cambodia to bring more parts of the value chain in manufacturing, in the garment sector, in the country. At the moment, more or less, um, the garment, the, 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 the end product is assembled here and then it's chipped. Um, all the other parts of the value chain um, are still in China. Um, that needs to shift because then you can also create something around. Um, when you want to develop a garment factor, I think it's also important that you work on your marketing, on your own brands, on your own designers. That you, that you are not just producing for, for the big uh, companies around the globe. Um, and here also the, comes education in, um, but um, I think that is uh, important. And then the next thing is access to markets. Um, at the moment, Cambodia is highly reliant on just two markets, it's the US and uh, the European Union. Um, 
at the moment, Cambodia just exports 10% of its products to ASEAN. So this ASEAN economic integration can be, can be um, a, a big factor from Cambodia's development. At the same time, we have these risks in this international trade agreements. Uh, Cambodia lost parts of the EBA status. Uh, at the same time, EU signed a free trade agreement with Vietnam. And the prediction is just because of this EU-Vietnam free trade agreement, uh, that Cambodia lost around 350 million in exports, just because Vietnam is now on, an, on a level playing field uh, with Cambodia. Um, I think this is also um, important to acknowledge, and there's a, a big uh, potential for Cambodia in uh, the ASEAN uh, economic integration. So that's more or less from my side. So my three takeaways are uh, the Cambodian garment sector is in high risk of disappearing, but it's, the sector is so important for Cambodia that it's that um, Cambodian government should do everything to keep the sector competitive. Um, I think um, the digital transformation is a chance to catch up, to leapfrog. Um, but the old hard ingredients for economic success, like education and infrastructure, are still essential. Um, and I think digitalization must be shaped politically to, to avoid the negative effects of disruption. Um, if you want to read more about Cambodia, um, you can check our website or you can scan this QR code here. This is a publication about e-governance in Cambodia, but it also touches some economic topics. Um, and we, um, we did another book on the future outlook of Cambodia's uh, economy. Um, this is a book called Cambodia 2040. There are three volumes. Um, the one you see here is on economy, and it's, um, and eight, I think, eight uh, Cambodian authors write about, um, with foresight methodology, um, about the predictions um, for Cambodia in the year 2040. I, I highly recommend this book um, because uh, there's not, not, there are not many high-quality high publications in Cambodia. Um, from Cambodians, um, and this is one uh, definitely worth to read. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks a lot for those insights uh, from your country. Um, thank you also for drafting out those different scenarios, and I understand that there's very much room still um, to change the settings around the garment factory to make them, to enable them uh, to survive the future and the changing technology um, uh, processes. Um, but I also understand if nothing is done, Cambodia looks at quite a doomsday scenario and it will face even more unemployment and more dependencies. Now, we finally arrived at our question and answer session. Um, well, I have plenty myself, um, of course, as moderators, my job to um, ask those that uh, were addressed to you guys. So now I will um, open up the chat room and we had have had a first um, question coming from uh, or addressing Myanmar um, that you see in the chat room. The question is, what would you advise countries like Myanmar with poor education outcomes and low link to value chains? Just as something that we've seen in the Cambodia study that are facing the huge need to catch up in terms of technology change. So this is Edgar Rodriguez um, asking from the International Development Research Center in Canada. And um, I will, uh, while you're sketching down this question, I'll read the next one coming from Indonesia from Niwayan Pasek Ariati, is Indonesia really far behind in terms of technology? Um, I would leave it with those two. And due to the time constraints, um, keep your answers to the point. <laughs> so floor is yours. Who would like to address the first question on um, Myanmar? Who would be able to do that? Okay, Elisabetta. Uh, thank you, Rabea. I think uh, I think uh, both uh, Christian and Daniel have already pretty much addressed the the issues that uh, have been asked about Myanmar. Um, let's see if I can quickly share a slide that summarizes um, the issue. Um, 
that I they were asked about. Uh, there it is. I hope you can see the slide. So yes. these are all topics that have been already mentioned by Christian and Daniel. Uh, it's all revolving around technologies. So if, in response to technology, I, again, I cannot emphasize more education and training and the fact that it's really a 360 approach. Um, I think Christian said it very eloquently that you can't just solve everything by retraining workers. This is a kind of work that starts in very early childhood. And it doesn't matter if someone is going to go on to be a college professor or, a, a, you know, a, somebody who works in the fields, they still need to have that particular set of skills that will allow them the mental elasticity to respond to changed environments. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't stop there. Again, Christian mentioned favorable labor regulations. It's true the demand for what he mentioned, like low skilled workers, it's true the demand for those workers is still there. But the problem is that we are getting into a context of decent work, making sure that these jobs for so-called low skilled workers are still allowing them to, to make a living social protection, making sure that workers uh, if they are in between occupations, they have a, a safety net and a system to guide them uh, from one occupation to another. And of course, taxation. But that doesn't stop there because the, you also have uh, uh, policies that leverage technologies to, to help workers. So technology can be used to facilitate skill development and job matching technology can be used to, pro, to, to improve provision of public goods and services. So it's not just something that we have to respond to, it's something that we can harness uh, to, to it's, it's, it's what I tend to say is that it's a, it's a problem, but it's also part of the solution. And finally, I think Daniel has emphasized that a lot, support for technology. You need the ICT infrastructure. You need that antitrust and consumer protection in place. You need an environment that is conducive to innovation and technology adoption. So it's really a tough set of homework for any economy, but in particular for economies like Myanmar or Cambodia or and, um, uh, but yes, if I could pick one of these, I would say education, 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 and then more education. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Let me move on to the next question. Um, how do we offset the widening income inequality within countries between manual laborers and non-routine highly skilled laborers, especially in countries with limited fiscal resources? goes to um, Christian and Elisabetta, I suppose. Mm -hmm. What are you taking this, Christian? Yeah, I can start on, on that one. I mean, in principle, I think it also relates to some of uh, what I mentioned, because I mean, there's like this, this uh, huge focus, I think, uh, among countries in the region, yeah, to basically have uh, training programs to make the those that are actually already high skilled, even higher skilled, like to have them really um, ad adopting the skills uh, of uh, yeah, digital re related to digital technology, industry 4.0. Uh, and so on. So it's really uh, a lot of the discussion is really you get the impression that the country aims to bring itself really to the technology frontier to be like really the leader. Well, actually, I think uh, you simply need to recognize actually that uh, the vast majority of the population, you know, like if you, yeah, the vast majority of, of the population is quite far away from these uh, developments still, because if, if you, for example, travel through Thailand or through other countries of this region, like in rural areas, you know, like, I mean, you, you see farmers there. If you, if you go through the through the cities, you see like uh, people selling uh, fruits and vegetables. I mean, these are, these people are at least currently like extremely far away from those uh, discussions. And I think it's exactly important also to not forget about uh, those. And um, Elisabetta also has uh, mentioned it or, or repeated it now. Um, yeah, like to focus really on uh, making sure that these uh, workers also have uh, decent working conditions, that uh, their incomes uh, yeah, allow them to, 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 yeah, to be basically be at least out of poverty. Um, yeah, and then basically also, you know, like education, uh, also requires investments. It requires investments also of uh, of uh, families, um, and I think uh, it's very important to make sure that uh, 
people actually have uh, enough uh, income to allow uh, their children uh, to go to, for example, the university. And uh, yeah, so I think these are uh, some points apart from uh, infrastructure development, which I think is very important. And also it relates to the question on Myanmar that was asked before, um, because without uh, that, I think, um, I mean, I think this can also create a bit of a divide, uh, obviously, if uh, infrastructure is just developed in the cities. But if you forget about the rural areas, I think, um, yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christian. From all of your presentations, um, I took away that uh, many governments are not yet aware and that the necessary dialogue that especially in the better called out is uh, not happening yet. Um, that brings me to my question uh, to both of your institutions. I know what CAS is doing to mitigate that and um, our programs are of course dialogue and um, bringing those issues on the table, but how is the ADB and the ILO um, engaged to foster that dialogue? Thank you. Elisabetta? Thank you, Rabea. Uh, this is an excellent question. I think uh, ADB is taking uh, an approach that is very similar to what I showed you before, in the sense that it's uh, supporting education, in particular technical and vocational education. Uh, when we were talking about Myanmar, I actually had an opportunity to visit several sites of, of uh, technical and vocational schools where, where ADB has co-funded some very interesting uh, initiatives. So education is definitely one area. And the second important area is innovation. There are some, our, some of our member countries that are already making efforts. And by the way, we mentioned Indonesia before. Indonesia is one of them. We are supporting a project on uh, higher education and innovation. So uh, the second pillar is really uh, stimulating innovation and in, in, in an environment conducive to innovation. And the third pillar, which is basically what we, the bread and butter of the Asian Development Bank is infrastructure. ADB has always, always been highly involved in the development of infrastructure in the region. So uh, that means ICT infrastructure, that means transport, that means energy, that means all the areas that are quite strategic for, 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 for the industrial revolution preparedness. Um, so I would say that those three prongs, that uh, three pillars that I've shown before, we are uh, pretty much all over the place. And this obviously depends also on what state the member country is at. Um, thank you. Christian. Yes, and, uh, yeah, at the ILO. Um, I mean, I think at the ILO, we have um, the advantage actually that, you know, like it's, it's a kind of a specialized uh, UN agency and among the UN agencies, it, it's quite uh, particular because, you know, like our uh, members are not only the governments from the countries, but actually also from each member state, we have the trade unions and also mm -hmm. the employer associations um, that are members and that come together to discuss uh, all those issues. So I think uh, what we at the ILO are putting a lot of emphasis uh, on is actually providing this uh, platform actually for the social partners to come together and actually find uh, solutions for all these uh, challenges. And uh, typically those solutions that are then found, uh, they have like actually a, a, a large backing from a, a wide group in the society, uh, given by the fact that actually workers and employers are both uh, sitting on the table and uh, yeah, are, are there to basically develop uh, those solutions. And then, I mean, in terms of concrete uh, practical work, um, of course, we are supporting uh, countries uh, worldwide and also in this region in uh, developing their social protection systems, uh, developing social protection floors. Uh, also, um, if countries are interested uh, to have a minimum wage, we provide some uh, technical advice on what is perhaps a, a good way of doing it and what you should avoid. Also on uh, technical uh, edu uh, vocational education and training, we provide advice and basically essentially we provide uh, technical support on all issues uh, relating to, to labor standards and, uh, and so on. So, so this is, I think, let's say in a nutshell, in uh, one or two minutes uh, summary what the ILO is doing. Thank you very much. I'll tend to a question that is in our chat box now. I know we're doing overtime now, so this is the last question here. Are the current human infrastructure enough for this innovation and work cooperation? Who would like to take this question? Coming from Lile Zhang, if I pronounce that correctly, sorry. 
I so think it's only fair that Daniel takes with this one. Yes. <laughs> so he's laughing already. The, the, the question if it's about Cambodia or, or the globe or uh, Asia or, uh, but I mean, to focus on, uh, on, on Cambodia, it's not enough at the moment. So there needs to be more investment. Um, but I take this opportunity for one minute um, just to um, emphasize what Christian said. It, you have to be realistic and policymakers have to be realistic. This big dreams of digitalization is such a huge chance and we catch up, we leapfrog and we are getting there so easily. That's so unrealistic. It's a long way. It takes hard effort. Um, and um, yeah, I think that, that's uh, where policymakers should should be aware of and that's also let's say our job as a political think tank to transfer the knowledge that is out there um, and raise awareness with policymakers um, when it comes to their decision making thank you very much unfortunately we did reach um, the end of our session my uh, five minutes overtime request is already up um, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your excellent and insightful and thought-provoking presentations. We have done, we have taken a lot of notes, and I'm sure uh, many others are, of our listeners have done that. Um, your excellent three points takeaway are available on, uh, will be made available. But um, let me call on my takeaways: education, education, education is what rang the bell and um, skills and training, but I also, I think it is important to tend to the dialogue that has been uh, missing so far between the stakeholders to intensify this and your, um, all of our works, uh, CAS, ILO, ADB, and all the other multilateral institutional work is important um, to work on models that mitigate those income and, still, uh, and skill division that uh, we are about to be seeing. And I also took away that ASEAN will and can play a role. Before I close, I'd like to thank Joe that I'm seeing here for again for inviting us. And uh, we have another um, very important two cents worth in our chat box that I like to all three of you take a look at after we um, close this. It's Professor Haruto Sato a professor from uh, Osaka University um, that uh, actually writes into all our books, um, future projects to think outside of the nation state centric model. And I think this is a good um, closing notion for us to continue our work. Thank you very much. And I herewith end the session. Thank you very Thanks. much, Andrea. Thank you so much for that. That was fascinating and I, um, the education, 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 I think will link very well to our next panel, um, which is on academic freedom and uh, which starts in um, in around 10 minutes. So please don't go away. And again, if you have any um, uh, questions or any follow ups to that particular panel, then the chat stays open and um, Rebea and, um, and panel, if you could stay around and, and, and maybe address some of those and put uh, respective emails or, or follow ups as needed. Okay, that's it. We'll see you in about 10 minutes for the next session. Thank you again, Rebea.